<laughs> and the pair of us having a drink and waving our arms about. Hello. <laughs> well, I'm really lucky this week because I've got Georgia Vargas. I can't pronounce your name, Nandia. Georgia Vargas. Did I get that right? Beautiful. Oh. Like a native. Thank God for that. Um, Georgia with me. And I know Georgia a little because I've had the pleasure of actually working with her. Georgia is amazing. She is or has been a professional saxophonist, an actress, a playwright, a performer. You've done um, street performances too and things like that, haven't you? And all sorts of things. She's written several books. You can see some of them behind her head. Yes, you can. And at the moment, but she's got a lot of life left in her yet, so it may change. Um, at the moment, she is a book coach. And she's also a marketing coach. And that's what I went to her for. And that's how I found her. So, Georgia, we're going to talk about life, the universe and everything. And most of all, about you. Looking forward to it, Ellen. Looking forward to it. I have to say straight up that, that a lot of people think I, I was an actress or I am an actress or something, but I'm not really, and I'll tell you why, but if you give me good lines, I promise you I'll repeat them. And that means? I've got a few skills in that department, but I, ha I, have, be I have been on stage when uh, I wrote a play and about two weeks before the uh, show was due to go on, the leading actress backed out because her fingernail broke or something, something serious, right? And the director looked at me and says, well, you have to do it. You're the only one that knows the part. And I was, <laughs> oh God, I don't want to play her. I don't even like her. You know, it was all this, I'm trying to find every excuse, but you know, the show goes on regardless. Yeah. yeah. And I did it and I did it because I had to, and I did the best job I possibly could. Mm. And sometimes people said, that was dreadful. And I went, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was a tough shoot, wasn't it? That was really, yeah. yeah, yeah. Very difficult to get into that. Well, since I got that wrong, and um, and yet not wrong, because you have acted. It was just a variation on, you know. Variation on the screen. Filling the gaps a bit. Tell me, Georgia. Who is the Georgia inside there? What's the Georgia who is the firing up of all of this stuff that you've done all your life? She's right here. <laughs> Just like that. You see, I said she was an actress. <laughs> <laughs> um, what makes me who I'm? I, I, I just, I'm a fiery girl. I feel passionate about many things, Ellen. And I think that gives me the get up and go. And I... I like to bring out that passion in people, mm. you know, and I, you know, it's very interesting. You should say that at this moment, because I watched the movie, I love movies. I watched the movie last night. And the only thing that kept me going was it was about 16th century Venice. Mm. And it was about a woman who came from a kind of what we would say today, middle-class type family. And the, her dowry had been drunk by the uh, by the father who was no longer there the eldest daughter was married and and the mother said to her you've got two choices you can become a nun or a courtesan and so the mother took her to the nunnery and within five minutes she ran away <laughs> yeah i can understand that <laughs> she saw the hair being cut and no, 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 no. <laughs> And the mother says, don't worry, I will teach you to be a great courtesan because my mother taught me and that's how I married. <laughs> oh, I like it. What's the name of this film then? It's called Dangerous Beauty. That sounds like one to go on my watch list. Yeah. It was good. It's, you know, there was a little bit of romantic stuff. It went Romeo and Juliet in between places here and there. But what was great about it, Ellen, was that she, as a courtesan, was allowed to have an education. Yes. She was allowed to read. She was allowed to become a poetess. She was allowed to be a performer. She could ride a horse. She could learn to sword fight. She could learn to be the woman she wanted to be. Until the Catholic Church 
invaded the place. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and the thing about it was that her work was to satisfy all the wealthy men, including the top cardinals and the Doge and all these other people yeah. that were so prominent in Venice at that time. Mm. But she had a wonderful reputation, mm. although, of course, the wives of these noblemen did not like her. <laughs> You know, but in the end, it was, well, what are you going to be? A virgin, a mother, or a whore? You've got a choice. Yes. That's all you can be in life. Yeah. That's all you had to choose from in life. Yeah. yeah. So, f fascinating. And then, and then now you jump forward all those centuries to here we are, 2023. And in some parts of the world, that hasn't changed. That's absolutely true. I was only talking about that with somebody this morning and down to the arranged marriages and all this sort of thing that happens. But it still happens a bit, even in Western society, because yes. there is an expectation still in various bits of apparently quite modern and civilised society. Yeah. And there's also still an expectation, you know, that you'll be all right, love, the husband will look after you. And I don't know, that always feels as though you're selling yourself security. Yeah to me yeah. but um, so, just awkward so-and-so's <laughs> yeah so going back to the passion you know she was yes. in the end she was um you know held by the inquisition all these Gosh. hypocrites these absolute religious hypocrites mm. and um she had to defend herself because they were ready to burn her at the stake yeah until the women the mothers the the wives stood up for her and all the men that she'd had relationships with stood up for her. I said, well, we're just as guilty. Even That's the cardinal beautiful. said, well, yeah, I've, I've been with her too, you know. <laughs> That's really beautiful that they all did. Mm -hmm. I can yeah, give it a twist with the women, though. And I, I, as, a, as a coach and life coach, I've had chats with women. Well, you know, I've been working with women who have had difficulties with their partnership relationships and where the partner has been unfaithful and maybe run a mistress as well as them. And some of them have actually said, you know, when you're able to get down deep and they're trusting enough, it's sort of like, well, actually, they take some of the strain off. The mistress takes some of the strain off my relationship and I get time to be me when he's with her. And I thought that was quite interesting for people to say. Mm -hmm. and a very sort of deep thing like that but but that works that works okay but if you think about it the other way around and I always illustrate it like a man can come home from his work put his suitcase a uh, briefcase on the table and he get a phone call and he'll say I have to pop out again it's work can you imagine a woman coming back from a day at the office puts her briefcase down and goes Hang on a minute, I've got to go out again. <laughs> well, oh, I've that. actually been in that situation and been that woman, but yes, it's unusual. <laughs> Very it's funny you should say that because in, in my coaching work, what I find is that the women take much longer to decide. And to decide you know, the men come on to decide whether they want to work with you, to decide whether they want to write a book, whether oh, they want yeah. to do whatever it is in mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And very often the women say, I have to ask my husband. No. Oh, my dear. Oh, those poor girls. Or oh. they just, you know, they, they need to ask somebody because they, well, put it the other way around. The men say, yes, I want to work with you or no. They don't ask anybody because they haven't got, any, you know, they haven't got that responsibility <laughs> to consider. No. No, no. It still goes on. That's yeah, right. it does. And, well, I'm, I'm remembering working with you. Um, I worked with Georgia very particularly for a couple of months um, around the new year. And I think some of her passion is actually about changing that. I mean, not that I was the woman who said, um, I've got to ask my husband how to write, a, you know, may I write a book? Um, no, I, I'm not one of those. Um, but I needed to hear back what Georgia saw of me because I couldn't see it. 
Mm. I think that's a lot of what you do, isn't it, Georgia? Yeah, it, it is. Um, you know, I think our work as coaches is to listen well, of course, to give guidance and advice, of course, and our points of view, not yep. so much opinion, but points, professional point of view. Yeah. But it's also to help you realize your accomplishments, your achievements, your accolades, how wonderful you are, how amazing that you've done things in your life. Mm. And I love doing that. Mm. Yeah. I love to encourage um, the woman, especially. And, and, you know, I remember working with one woman and I said to her, is your hair, do you always tie your hair back in that sort of nun outfit look? <laughs> and, and she said to me, well, it's convenient for my work. And I said, well, well, let's just hang it down. Let's see now. Ooh, do you ever use lipstick? You know, and it was making her feel like oh, there's another way that she could put herself forward. Yeah. She's adapted to what is good for her, yeah. as we all do. But it's this, I think particularly with British women, they're quite shy to show yeah. the best of themselves yeah. Yeah. and to put on that, you know, professional appearance which means looking good yeah. why shouldn't you look good nature does it all the time Ellen absolutely and um, certainly around me it, it's really starting to put its spring dress on mm. um, and you know maybe we should too as yes. well. uh, I feel it's important and um I'm not I've not used uh, Georgia yet as a writing coach um but this may well happen because of things that might be going on. But do you find that that is important with writing as well, that you don't do any fiction, do you? I have done, yes. It's not as popular in my line of work, but, yeah, I have done, yeah. But do you feel that this, like, bringing out yourself, because certainly is for me as a fiction writer, you put yourself into your characters. But in the non-fiction, in a business book, for instance, how hard is it for people to actually bring themselves out into that business book? Well, you know, I try to emphasize, Ellen, that it's finding that balance between illustrating your lessons with a story, mm -hmm. illustrating your point, your expertise, your authority, your business angle, what you have learned in life with a good story. Mm -hmm. And very often you find people either have too many stories and not enough ability to write the lessons or they just are all lessons and no story and so it's helping people find that balance mm. to recognize that they've got plenty of stories to illustrate mm. the points they want to make so sometimes it's about encouraging that writer to describe what are the points they want to teach train um, to let people know about what they're going to write about what are those topics yeah and then matching them up with the stories. Yeah. Um, but last year I worked with a woman who has more stories than you could count. And it was hard work because it was, I've got this story about this. And I'm yeah, but wait a minute, let's go back to that lesson. Let's go back to what it is that you want to share with your reader. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that. And I, I've written some nonfiction books too. And it is important to have the stories. And But it's also like, what is the story? What is the point that this story is illustrating? Yes. And not to give too many points to somebody because otherwise they're sort of blah, 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 and they're sort of completely deluged in information and not enough. Which one am I supposed to focus on? Which can be really quite hard. But do you find in in your novel writing, in your fiction writing, because you said that you you put your you put yourself into those characters mm. and. Is, is that sometimes difficult to separate yourself from the characters? Because you can't put yourself into every character. Or do you? You put yourself into their shoes. Is that what? It... You put yourself into their shoes, yes. But you, it's, it's deeper than that. I mean, I do have some acting training. And when I was training, method acting was very much to the fore, which it still is fairly well, but mm. it, it was very much to the fore then, which is about being. The character you know there you are you're playing Juliet so you are Juliet for those moments while you are playing her yes. and you have to get right in and feel what would Juliet do in this situation and so there is that side of it but 
it's always going to be tempered by me. Um, it's very tough writing fiction if you want to try and write it so that people can read it, because you have to bring out all the what they call the pain points in you. Uh, because those are going to be what's going to happen with your characters. And it doesn't matter whether the, it's a, a male or a female character. You can still do this and feel what it would be like to be there. And that can be very tough. And if you're writing a scene where something either immensely gorgeous happens or immensely painful happens, I come out of it sweating because I've been there. And done it. It's like uh, uh, tea. Somebody make me tea now, kind of thing. And yeah. do you find? Because I mean, when you're writing a business book, you have to write about people's pain points, don't you? Because that's part of what you're sharing. Do you find yes. people feel this difficulty with going into their own pain points because those are going to be the best stories to share? Sometimes, but you know, Ellen, I think there's a point that's very important to. Uh, uh, put out here is that if that pain point is still causing you lots of emotions and upsets mm. you may not be ready to, to no. write about it yeah that's true yeah especially if you want to do speaking from the book you know mm. uh, you you can't go on stage let's put it like this you can't go on stage and say well you know when I was 12 this happened to me oh my god and you start you can't no. do that. No. You have to be over it to a certain extent. And I think it's the same with the writing because it, then it gives you the perspective, the objective eye, which is what your reader needs. You and, and as we know, you always have your reader in mind yeah. as you're writing. So you might be that character. You might put yourself in their shoes, but you're always thinking, well, the reader, where's the reader's, you know, there. Yeah, yeah. I think it applies to the, the same, but... It's important that you have, you know, um, overcome in a way that big drama, trauma that you've experienced in order to be able to write about it with the right perspective. Yes, with a, with a readable perspective in that way. Because it's, I mean, it's the same in a film, isn't it? If it gets, it can be you're there in, I don't know. Because, I mean, I can think of films where I'm there in tears because of something that's actually happening in the film. And I do remember that and I learn about it a lot. Um, I know from the acting that I did that you come out of that as stressed, as, you know, sort of shaky, shaky. But you have to get over it again because in the next scene you're going to be better or worse or different anyway. <laughs> but it is shaky. And I don't know, because people like it in films, don't they? They like to be terrified or horrified or in tears or whatever. I don't like horror films. I've, there's enough horror in the world. I don't want to watch it. I don't like all that. No, stuff. but some people do. So, you yeah, know, some people love that emotion. thrill, that adrenaline ride. Mm. I suppose it's the same as when you go on one of them one of them rides. Yeah, I can't do those either. <laughs> no, oh, I would hate them. I'd hate them. So, um, yeah, I think it's a personal choice. And there obviously is a big market for that mm -hmm. um, fearful kind of experience, you know, the adrenaline run. Mm. Yeah, yeah, indeed there is. But when you're trying to show somebody something, as you are in a business book, um, about how you would do this or how you would work the finances this way or how you would work with your team that way or whatever it is that you're trying to show, then to be that emotional would be right over the top and out of court wouldn't it yeah for most people yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, I think there are cultural differences though there are cultural differences where people speak more directly with each other and they're not offended mm. yes they use the imperative do it measure it get yeah. it oh yeah. please and, yeah. and they wouldn't be offended by it whereas in some societies uh they would really be offended if you talk like that so I think it's about understanding who you're working with as well, you know. Um, and then that baby, how, you know, who your audience is again. It's the same thing. Yes, exactly. It is very much. But um, you can't, you can't always, you know, I mean, people, I'm sure people have said to you, so who's your book for? And you would have said ABC. And then you find that X, Y, and Z bought the yeah. book more than the ABC. So there's a little bit of, you know, there play is, in yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, um, there is. 
and people have said to me because I, I, my books have a romantic thing going through them always, always difficult, but it's always there. And they say, oh, well, then you're writing for women, are you? And I say, well, there's a hell of a lot of men read them too. And sometimes people go, oh, really? You know, know. and so, well, actually, you know, the other half, since I write heterosexual romance, the other half of the relationship is actually a man. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, men do get into this kind of situation, but it is difficult. But I want to go backwards. What started you? It's the saxophone you used to play, or do you still play? It's over there, actually, looking at me. Oh dear! Are you still playing? <laughs> I, I've hung it up next to my pistols. Ah, right. And um, your, the pistols are ancient, or are they, you know, Glocks or something? <laughs> still smoking. They're still smoking, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you? What, what set you off into the music? I think it was always there. Um, mm-hmm. You know. I loved singing and dancing as a child. I wasn't particularly good, you know, I just loved it. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. Well, I tell you, can I tell you a story about that? Please do. A lovely little story. I use this quite a lot in my public speaking things, but it's a lovely story. I've got this black and white photo of me, of me in a pram when I'm probably, I don't know, six months, nine months old, something like this, with a big fat nappy on me. <laughs> And I'm singing away, I'm really happy, really, really happy, and loud singing, enjoying it. And my nappy was really full, like full. But I guarantee that my mother heard me, understood me, and believed me. And that's when she ran out and took a photo. (laughs) (laughs) Now, being heard, understood, and believed, yeah, it wasn't always something that happened to me in my life. And it was often, I think it's a struggle for a lot of us, especially women, mm. to be heard, understood and really believed, you know, that and not be belittled and put down and ignored and so on. Mm. But that sort of was, you know, very much my personality. Mm. I was a happy, didn't matter what went on, didn't matter whether my parents hated love, each, each other what was going on I was just able to be singing away and ignoring everybody <laughs> <laughs> and it's um it just took me into that creative world yeah just yeah. you know introduced me to that creative world I've always done something like that in my life something creative and whether it was mud pies in the garden or <laughs> <laughs> And you still are. I mean, writing the books is very creative, but so is, I mean, people sort of say, oh, yes, writing a book is creative, and it is, but so is actually helping other people to write books. Mm. And I think people don't realise how creative that is. How much do you have to, when you're working with anybody, how much of your creative stuff, I mean, I find it with coaching that, you're creating new ways of doing things, new ways of saying things, new ways of responding to somebody all the time. Are you doing the same thing? Yes, absolutely. Mm. And and I think the other thing, Ellen, is that, um, you know, we are always looking for creative solutions. Yes. And that, and I think that is, you know, that is the way forward. Yes. This is the way forward in the world, not to always go with the traditional, what was written, what's been said, the programmed nonsense, which we are seeing very clearly is not working at all anywhere. Mm. And, you know, it's looking for the creative solution. Yeah. Okay, that one didn't work. Let's try something. Or what else could we try? Mm. Have you thought of? Oh, eternal, what if we? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I agree, it's not said enough. And uh, I we, just before we started, I was saying, you know, I just talked to a couple of lovely young women. I'm an old woman, so I can say young woman. And <laughs> um, they're gorgeous. They're really fun, living all over the place, doing amazing creative things. And, you know, and they're only sort of like in their early 30s. And they're saying there's too much formulation. There's too much follow the rules. There's too much. If it's not written down, we're not doing it. We don't want that. We want to start new thinking, new creation. 
And I found that just so refreshing. Absolutely. Yeah. We definitely need, you know, new ways of approaching situation, more creative ways to look at things mm. and to disregard some of that dreadful programming that we've all been experiencing for what, 2,000 years. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, certainly 2,000, if not possibly if not more. more. Yeah, I was being yeah. generous there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I think you find people of all age groups are beginning to think outside of the box, but it's great to see younger generation doing it. But I, th I find in people of all generations are really, you know, looking for the blessing in life, yes. looking for that creative yeah. um, approach to life. And it's, it's you know, it's, for my, in my opinion, it's the only way to survive. Yeah. Well, I think so, too, because, um, it, and one, OK, I'm going to have a little mini one. I think you're going to join me in it, is the phrase, one of the phrases I hate worse is back to normal. <gasps> Have a drink first before you choke. <laughs> it's it's not vodka, it's water. Uh, it should have been vodka after that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, later, later. But back to normal, I mean, apart from anything else, it's impossible. I mean, have you tried, as any of you out there, have you tried going backwards in your life? I was just going to say, you can't go back. <laughs> There is no reverse gear. Sorry, <laughs> we weren't built with one. No, exactly, exactly. I, mean, I think that we have a lot of cliches in our language that holds us back. And as writers, we know this really yeah. well. Yeah. These dreadful cliches, you know, uh, that we see all the time on social media, especially, but even amongst each other. Yeah. How are you? I'm fine. Oh, that's one yeah that one does oh, how nice how no oh okay lovely <laughs> yeah, yeah or, we're, we're so used to saying these things yeah or i had one um earlier this week because somebody I, I was telling we, it was important that i and this other person um shared we were talking about when we were last in our comfort boxes mm -hmm. And it was very interesting because it actually made me think. And I thought, actually, when was I last in my comfort box? <laughs> I was actually going, I was like, no, 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 back, 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 back. And it actually worked out when I was about three. <laughs> and I, I'm quite serious because, um, and don't anybody start doing this. Now, my mother died of cancer when I was three. Now, at the time, all sorts of things, yes and no. Um, but this person immediately went, oh, how awful to me. This was one hell of a long time ago. I know what was going on with my mum. I know what was going on with my dad. And I know in those days they had no cancer medication like we do now. And I'm not still in that sense, grieving her death. I'm not still bound back in the loss of mummy. And it was really irritating to me that somebody felt that I would be. Mm. And so it's, that's a kind of a, something that I would love to get creative, people to get creative about and say, if anything, you just say, how do you feel about that now? Fine, she's gone. It's okay. We'll be fine. But it's a bit like the sort of, oh, that's so nice. Oh, how dreadful, my dear. Yeah. They're still feel like compelled to. Meant. Sorry. No, 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 you're right. They, they, people feel compelled to say something. Mm. They think it's polite, especially, yeah. you know, um, certain nationalities more than others. They feel compelled to <laughs> respond that uh, I've got to say something now. Instead of just, Okay, let that person say, let yeah. them speak. So, a little bit of silence won't hurt. Absolutely not. You know, they might have something else to say. Or, I don't, you know, I recognize it was a long time ago. Therefore, I don't have to say anything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this compulsion to respond, and that's like we've all been educated into it or sublimated into it or whatever. Yeah. Um, Definitely, yeah. 
Mm. I, mean, I think we all fall for it. I mean, there's times when I go, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's... You know, we do, we, we do it without thinking, because as you said, we've been, um, you know, brainwashed, educated, programmed, whatever word you want to use. Yeah. We've all had those things. This is what you say when it's, or you copy the other people. Yeah. As a child, you see the adults go, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, that must be true. Yeah. And, and we learn it, like we're little parrots, aren't we? We are. And I mean, that is how you learn. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, later on, please, can we have a little bit of discrimination about when we ought to be saying things <laughs> and when actually silence is good, because silence is good. Yeah. And not to be afraid of it, you know, and to recognise that a little bit of critical thinking won't hurt. Mm. yeah I quite agree with you but yeah so what is your what are you doing at the moment Georgia I mean what's your next project that you want us all to get in, excited about well I just did a master class you did class. and I was there you were there and um, I love your contributions thank you but it was and, great fun yeah and you know the, there's always this stimulating discussion that we have at the end which is fascinating mm. to hear the stories and ideas that people have Mm. for writing books and how it it sparks others to say something and, and then once you've said it you think oh my god I really do have a book in you can say it now. <laughs> and I think that's the exciting I mean you were actually saying on that master class that now I don't half an hour before <laughs> I'm leaving now she's going to call me out <laughs> <Go on. laughs> I took notes <laughs> I, there you are you see <laughs> so um no on the back of that um because there were quite a few people who couldn't make it for all the different reasons that people have in their lives. Yeah. And they, and I, I've decided to do it again on the 29th, on Wednesday the 29th, to run it again. So this is Wednesday. Wednesday evening the 29th. That's going to be... 29th of March. Absolutely, yeah. So it's going to be 6 p.m. UK. Okay. British summertime by then. Yeah, it will be. Which and it'll be 7, 7 p.m. It's one o'clock for the USA, isn't it? Yes, we we come onto the same timeline as them. We East Coast, Eastern Standard Time, yeah. and it'll be seven p.m. Anybody in Europe like myself, right? Okay. So I'm going to run it again um, with the title, with the same title: How to Write a Book That Will Resonate, Sell, and Last Without the Overwhelm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah how to write a book. That will resonate and last and without yes. the overwhelm. Yes. And what I desperately tried to hide and possibly even succeeded, so I shall have to come out with it now, is that in this, and I didn't think I was going to be right. I'm writing a fiction book at the moment. Um, I didn't think I was going to be writing a business book. And suddenly, um, because of the other people in the group, this is the power of working in groups, Mm -hmm. Be because of them I suddenly found I have got a business book inside me and damn you Georgia you called me out on it <laughs> I was trying to pretend I hadn't done it <laughs> I think it will be a fantastic book you know I've only heard the two words of the I've got the sun coming in now look at this there's <laughs> only going to be a couple of words that I heard about it but just that was enough you know well We'll have to see where that goes, she said. Yeah, with time. Temporising and pushing it away. You can all see this, can't you? And you see, I'm just as bad as anybody else at all this stuff. So, yeah, it's important. But Georgia does these amazing masterclasses. But you were talking to me a while back that you were thinking of doing a small master group co coaching call or group book coaching call. Yes, I would love to do that. Um, what I'm finding is that there is a hesitant hesitancy mm -hmm. to actually um, join a group. And I've done, um, you know, four, six week sessions for, for people who wanted to start writing. And yeah. they were mostly people who've never written before, yeah. who wanted to write um, either a, bus a real business type of book, you know, exploring the work that they're doing in, sales or management or something like that yeah um it's you know I don't know what it is maybe it's something very personal that with writing a book whether it's whether it's fiction or non-fiction people want that individual attention yeah I can understand that 
Uh, I'm a member of a writing group and it is fun and I like them and they are very good and they're, they're nice and strongly critical, um, positively but strongly, um, which is such a help. You don't get, oh, Ellen, that was so lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Shoot, just... They won't get that from me. <laughs> no, but I mean, some writing groups, they either do that or else they just pick holes, pick holes, pick holes. Yeah. But these are positives. They're lovely guys. But it's still very difficult and I wouldn't want to write a book certainly not a fiction book in a group mm. I don't know whether I would with a business book and I've got this problem coming up for me haven't I so yeah I, I think that um you know when I did it this is my experience when I did it I had four people in the group which was plenty mm. and I thought how am I going to divide up the hour mm. to give each person enough time to discuss whatever it was that they were going through or needed brainstorming with or whatever it was their particular thing. And it was like roughly about 10, 12 minutes each. Yeah. There's another thing. It isn't, no. I think that is a problem. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the other side of that, that the person who's actually talking is like there and, you know, bang, 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 it's happening, really be happening between you. And the other people unless they're quite mature are going yeah they, they can be a bit of that the yeah. the best session out of that was when two people showed up the other two couldn't make the call mm -hmm. and this the, with the two of them on it was really good because they give because i always ask what do you think what yes. feedback would you give that writer yes exactly yes I, I become more of a facilitator i let them say what they think because most of the time it's two different topics. So they they become like the ideal reader, the better reader, the B E T A reader. I really like that idea. That would be that would be fun. I mean, to do it amongst four people would mean you'd have to put two hours into it, which is quite yeah, a signature of time, isn't it? Well, well, not just that, but you start to lag. Yes. You know, like 75, 90 minutes, you know, I'm already like yeah you're staggering a bit yeah if it's in the easy yeah it's too much um yeah so you could have two people who were doing this one-to-one -one. <laughs> yeah. i mean i think if it's like you want to start writing your book you've got six people who've got an idea you've had a one-to-one -one with them already so that they know what their topic is Mm -hmm. And then you could do four to six sessions of, okay, this is how you structure it. This is how you do it. And this is how you know. Right now, what are your problems? What are your situations? And then another session after. But, you know, that is what you call quality time and quality work on my part. And it ain't going to be cheap, darling. Well, this is the trouble and it can't be because the amount one has to put in. Maybe people don't realize this. When you're doing like 45 minutes or an hour, program with somebody um the amount of work you've put in beforehand and then the amount of work you put in afterwards and i wonder how many people realize that there's an awful lot of preparation goes in and an awful lot of, of debriefing of yourself afterwards yes that's a good way to put it yeah mm -hmm. uh, it's um oh, i've got the sunlight coming in now so i'm going to just adjust my screen a little bit. please do yes You're right, my love. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the debriefing, I think, is a really good word. Yeah. Uh, particularly if you've got big topics. Mm. Um, yeah, that can be, you know, you it's tiring because you're giving all your attention. Mm. Uh, and I think that's why we, we raise our fees on a regular basis, because we recognise the value that we're giving, mm. the work that we're putting in. Mm. And, you know, we recognise our self-worth. Because very especially with a book, you know, if you think that that person, we're going to work with you three, four, five months, whatever, six months, and then it goes into print for another three months, and then there's the marketing and this, that, and the other. That book is there for life. Yeah. Yeah. They've got amazing value mm -hmm. from the work that you've helped them create. Mm -hmm. You didn't create it. You helped them. You showed them the way. And that is, that is a val lifelong value. That's pretty amazing, really. And it really is. And um, I found this and I found 
I found, I mean, just, I wasn't working on a book with you, but I found that time we worked together was so, are you all right there? Yeah, I got this. Give me a second. I'll put down that blind. Every, every, give, go and put down, put the blinds yeah, down. That's it. absolutely fine. If you look at my what book. Things happen, you know, and thank God it's sunshine. <laughs> yes, sunshine, we have lots of it here. I love the sunshine like this. Now, is that better? Yeah, that's better, yeah. Okay, my love. Yeah. No, yeah. it's it is important. I mean, the time that I worked with you, it's just so valuable. And again, because of my digesting it all, because there's an awful lot comes in just an hour of working with Georgia. And I needed a week to digest it at least <laughs> and to start making it happen. Otherwise, yeah. it would just be pounding, pounding, pounding with information. And when you're hiring somebody, working with them, going to a group with them, it's really important to remember that. Yes. The person is going to be giving you all of that. So what yeah. should we look out for from you next? Your well, I'm, um, you know, as, as the world is changing, let's put it like that. Indeed. I'm looking... Um, I'm looking to do more speaking work because I think there's tremendous mm. value in, in, in the work that I do to encourage um, the expression uh, through writing. Yeah. And, you know, one of my great mottos is the voice and the pen are our two most powerful tools of communication. So let's use them. Yes. Yes. Let's use, you know, we're very lucky here in this part of the world that we can, we are taught to write. Mm. We are you know and and to read yeah. and these are fantastic gifts that we 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 must use and so it's a wonderful way to express ourselves and i think i've said this to you before ellen that we've seen all the road, road movies by men we go wrote all the road movies by men so now let's listen to the road movies by women <laughs> absolutely and wonderful I think that is perfect and so everybody Please come to the master classes with Georgia because they are so worthwhile. And I'll bet you at least some of you will want to work with her afterwards. I know I did the first time I went. And it's just like, oh yeah, I got excited. I got ideas. I got things happen. And so come along to them and do let us know when you're doing the speaking stuff and where we can find you. And if it's online, where we can join in. Absolutely. That would be brilliant. And thank you, Georgia, for being my guest. It's been such fun. Oh, it's wonderful chatting with you. Always enjoy it, Ellen. Thank you. And we may even be back with something else for you.